Hey, it's Erica. I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to Global News What Happened To ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Ruba Balal had been waiting for this moment her whole life. She had a home with her husband and two sons, and she finally felt settled. But while she felt comfortable, the country she called home was in the middle of a civil war. In 2012, Ruba was living in the Syrian capital, Damascus, and it had become increasingly dangerous. Ruba heard of her friends being detained, young men recruited to join military efforts, and never seen again by their families. For years, she worked to build a home for her family in Syria, where she was raised. But in a matter of months, it was no longer safe. It's really a a massive, um, difficult situation for everyone. I remember that there were bombing, uh, a lot of uh, detaining activists. Um, Politically, it wasn't, of course, stable. It was dangerous. At the time, Ruba was an activist working with young people in her community. We were helping in uh, getting aid for an under siege area. And we were all under risk. I mean, anyone could be under risk. We were discussing for a month. Um, My husband was worried about me because I was more active and now on political side. Uh, And my work as well was not uh, safe for me. So um, he just wanted me to go out. I mean, we were seeing a lot of my friends were detained, were uh, followed. Uh, We were every day worry that someone will knock the door and will take me. Not only me, actually, uh, most of the youth. I mean, even if they're not activists, they might go to work or university while in there in the bus, on their transportation, public transportation, um, like checkpoints, uh, could stop the bus, ask everyone to come, and they take the youth to military service, or they detain them. If they don't have an idea, any reason, they could be any reason to be detained. So uh, I remember all mothers in that uh, that time until now, they always worry about their kids when they're going to work or going to uh, university because they might go, never come back, and you'll never know where are they. So uh, as I said, you don't have the luxury to think. So... I figured out, me and my husband, that living in Syria now, it's not going to be safe for my two boys. Uh, And we agreed that we need to go to Lebanon and and seek, just to see how it goes, and then we will go back. Like all other refugees, when they left Syria, they thought it's going to be months and we will go back. In 2012, Ruba, her husband, and two sons left Syria and made the journey to Lebanon. She would be one of hundreds of thousands of people fleeing Syria. The only difference? Ruba and her family eventually made it to Canada. Alan Curdy and his immediate family did not. I'm Erica Bella, and this is part two of Alan Curdy and the Syrian Refugee Crisis. You'll remember from our last episode that Justin Trudeau and the newly elected liberal government promised to bring 25,000 Syrian refugees to Canada by the end of 2015. This was after the tragic photo of two-year-old Alan Curdy surfaced that September. You'll also remember that Alan, his brother Galib, and his mother Rehana drowned in the Mediterranean Sea near Turkey— when the family boarded a boat to Europe in hopes of a better life. The 25,000 promise had actually worked well politically. It was part of the um, new face of the new government, sunny ways from Mr. Trudeau with uh, a balanced, a gender balanced cabinet, all kinds of very positive humanistic elements in what they uh, promised, and one of them, which because it had been well received by the Canadian people, was this twenty five thousand. That's Peter Scholler. He's the former director of the Refugee Forum at the University of Ottawa Law School. 
He also worked in Lebanon for some time with the UNHCR. John McCallum at the time was uh, appointed to be the Minister of Immigration. Uh, and at the time, I was at the University of Ottawa, the director of the Refugee Forum, and a founding member of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers. And we had actually provided a lot of information to the Department of Immigration and to John McCallum on uh, refugees in general. And what we told him, we were not the only ones, uh, you can't get it done by December 31st. But we said it's not necessary. Why are you sticking to this promise? But the Liberal government, for whatever reason, whatever their view is, they continued to make this promise, we will get it done by the uh, 31st. Um, And uh, I was greatly concerned, having just recently been the previous year in Lebanon, I just knew that it wasn't going to be practical and wasn't going to work. So the Trudeau government said they wanted to have 25,000 Syrian refugees in Canada by the end of 2015. Remember, Trudeau had been elected just two months earlier, on October 19th of that year. But Peter said it wasn't going to work. Why was that? Well, he said at the time, there was a lot of concern from the U.S. about bringing people over from war-torn countries. So because of that, there has to be great care taken in the identification of people, and then you've got to process them. And that process includes um, health uh, examinations. Uh, And then secondly, the longer one is security examinations, but also requires uh, personal interviews. So simply the, with the resources that they had at the time in the Middle East, it's hard to gear up that quickly, just in terms of having the rooms, having the interpreters, all the work it takes to actually do that kind of assessment. And yet by the end of February, 2016, Five months after Alan Kurdi passed away, the federal government kept their promise and resettled 25,000 Syrian refugees in Canada. This included both privately sponsored and government sponsored refugees. And more refugees would come in 2016. But I couldn't help but think would any of this happen if it weren't for that photo of Alan on the beach? No, I, I don't think. I don't think that would have happened. Uh, as I say, it, it, was, um, it was, there was an element of serendipity in it, but the trigger was those combination of two things, that photograph and during uh, an election period. In 2014, Ruba and her family had been living in Lebanon for two years. My oldest son uh, finished high school, and it's not possible for young people to stay in in Lebanon. He cannot also go back to Syria. We cannot go back to Syria. So I had to send him to Germany. Uh, I managed to get him like a visa, study visa to Germany. It was a long process, but he got it. I just, I remember when I say goodbye to him in airport, in, in Beirut airport. He was 18 and it was the first time for his life to leave his mother. And I just sent him to Europe, and I know no one there. After I I, I say goodbye, I thought to myself, what am I doing? What am I sending my son? But what is the alternative? Staying in Lebanon? It's not safe for him. He he cannot study, he cannot work, he will be always chasing to have a a residency in Lebanon, which they're not going to give it to him. He cannot go back to uh, Syria, so... It's better to go to Germany, although I don't know what's waiting for him there, but he's safe. Ruba stayed in Lebanon with her husband and her youngest son. The situation in Syria had gotten a lot worse, and she knew her family would not be able to go back. She submitted an application through Lifeline Syria, and they worked to connect Ruba to the United Church of Canada, which was sponsoring refugees to come here. In 2016, She was accepted as a privately sponsored refugee. I get the chance to accept, to be accepted as a refugee here, like a private sponsor through United Church of Canada. They connect us with three families, ladies, amazing ladies, that they help us, like sponsored us socially, to support us, show us what to do and what 
and they also host us in their uh, in one of the ladies house in their basement for 40 days before I find my own rental and once we arrived here it was everything was new I mean there's nothing like home uh, if it, I remember that only when I'm looking at the sky, I feel, okay, this is the only thing it looks like my country. So everything was really new, challenging, difficult. We arrived in winter. It was minus 17, I remember, when I get out from the airport. You might remember feeling impressed that Canada was welcoming thousands of people who had been displaced. Or the photos of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau handing out coats to people who had just arrived from Syria in the middle of December. That was over five years ago. And I wanted to know if Canada kept up with its commitment to help people who are facing persecution. I asked Dr. Ifrat Arbel about it. She's an associate professor at UBC and works at the Allard School of Law. Her answer surprised me. There are, and really always have been, two sides to Canadian refugee protection. At various points in our history, um, Canada has shown uh, enormous generosity towards refugees. And this has been through the resettlement program. And, and as I noted earlier, the, the you know, I- I- incredible effort on behalf of so many Canadians to open their hearts and their homes to welcome refugees. Um, and this is something that, uh, that really should be commended and, and celebrated. But Dr. Arbel says there are laws that also keep refugees out. There is another side to Canadian refugee protection that we don't hear about often, which is that Canada has also been a pioneer in developing measures that make it very difficult for refugees to enter our territory. And these are measures that systematically close our borders to certain refugees. And they do so by blocking refugees from entering and keeping them um, in their countries of origin or in, in places of transit. And those are the measures that we don't hear about so often, uh, perhaps with the exception of the Safe Third Country Agreement. Okay, let's take a pause here. You heard Dr. Arbel mention the Safe Third Country Agreement, right? Well, before we get into why it's been in the news lately, I asked Dr. Arbel to explain what it is. So the Safe Third Country Agreement is a bilateral agreement that was signed uh, or that came into effect rather in December of 2004. Um, So this is uh, an agreement that has been in place for quite some time. The the basic... um, premise of the agreement is that both countries recognize one another as quote-unquote safe countries for refugees. And so the way the agreement operates is that it requires refugees to make their claims in the first country they land, either the U.S. or in Canada. Dr. Arbel says there are exceptions, like if someone has family in Canada and they moved through the U.S., that person will still be allowed in. There are other exceptions as well, but for the most part, if an asylum seeker makes their claim at a Canadian port of entry after traveling through the U.S. to get to that port of entry, they'll be sent back to the U.S. And from what Dr. Arbel explained, this agreement is causing a lot of issues for those seeking asylum. When that happens, when individuals are returned at the Canadian border by Canadian actors um, to the United States, they suffer extraordinary violations of their basic human rights. And the evidence has demonstrated um, consistently over many years that the United States is not actually a safe country for refugees. So the basic premise of the agreement is flawed. I had to think about this for a second. What did Dr. Arbel mean when she was talking about human rights violations in the U.S.? The United States refugee protection regime suffers from extraordinary flaws at the level of law, at the level of policy, and at the level of practice. The detention practices are horrific. There is no other way of saying it. Yes, some refugees are held in cages in truly inhuman conditions of confinement. We know extensively about the um, child separation policy in the United States. 
the extraordinary pain and trauma that has been caused to you know to so many children and their parents in these you know vicious um appalling ways uh and that and that's just you know that's just s- some aspects of the US refugee protection regime detention uh is is just rife with human rights violations uh refugees are held in prisons that are um uh, for profit prisons um sexual violence physical violence discrimination um, is widespread. Um, and at the level of law, uh, there uh, there are so many deep problems with the way in which the United States um, refugee determination regime is structured. Uh, poor access to counsel, um, legal barriers that um, can't be justified under international law, procedural obstacles, you know policies that that make it virtually impossible for some to seek uh, the, the 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 protection of the rule of law, and, and the list goes on. You know, so so yes, absolutely. The 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 photos of of kids in cages it, it speaks of the true horror of the U.S. refugee protection regime, and, and it's just one piece of a of a very awful puzzle. Dr. Arbel says there have been long-standing systemic issues with the U.S. refugee regime that date back to the time the agreement came into effect. But I do remember hearing the news stories from 2017. The United States will not be a migrant camp and it will not be a refugee holding facility. Won't be. Across town, Trump's cabinet secretaries were left to justify one of the president's signature measures. This revised order will bolster the security of the United States and her allies. In January 2017, then U.S. President Donald Trump imposed a travel ban against six Muslim-majority countries, Somalia, Iran, Syria, Sudan, Libya, and Yemen. Just days later... Several U.S. judges blocked federal authorities from enforcing the ban. There were legal challenges brought by the state of Hawaii and others. But in 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the travel ban. It was revised on a few occasions. Other countries were also added to the list, including Venezuela, Nigeria, and Tanzania. In 2021, Newly inaugurated U.S. President Joe Biden ended the travel ban as one of his first acts in office. Let's go back to the Safe Third Country Agreement. A number of refugee claimants challenged the agreement. They were joined by three public interest organizations, the Canadian Council for Refugees, Amnesty International, and the Canadian Council of Churches. They um, brought evidence before the court demonstrating that the United States is not a safe country for refugees, evidence based on their own experiences and um, from a a multitude of internationally recognized experts. The federal court heard this evidence uh, um, and heard from both the government and the applicants and decided in July of this year, so July 2020, that Uh, that the applicants were right, that the United States is not a safe country for refugees. Um, And that as a result, the Safe Third Country Agreement violates the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, specifically Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is the second time the agreement has been challenged. In 2005, the same group of applicants, the Canadian Council for Refugees, Amnesty International, and the Canadian Council of Churches, with another refugee claimant challenged the agreement, and a federal court ruled the U.S. is not a safe country for refugees and that the agreement is unconstitutional. What happened then was that the Federal Court of Appeal overturned this ruling based on a legal um, a set of legal principles that that are that have since been overturned, and so what this shows us is that it, not just once but twice, when Canadian courts have really examined the evidence, they have concluded that the United States is not safe, and that the agreement um, can't uh, can't be sustained according to Canadian standards of uh, rights protection. 
Canada's federal government is once again appealing the decision and has requested to temporarily suspend the federal court's decision until the appeal process is completed. So what does this mean? Basically, the Safe Third Country Agreement remains in place, at least for the time being. And this is truly alarming. And uh, it, it speaks of a, of, a, of a disregard for the fact that every day that the agreement remains in effect is a day that refugees suffer. And that's, uh, that's alarming. I brought up Dr. Arbel's concerns to the Office of the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. I wanted to see its response to the legal challenge, and I received an email from the minister's press secretary. It reads, and I quote, we are satisfied with the stay motion decision as the agreement will remain in effect until a decision on an appeal is made. We appealed the decision of the federal court because we believe there are errors in some of the key findings of fact and law. The decision suggests all asylum claimants who are ineligible under the safe third country agreement and turned back to the U.S. are automatically detained as a penalty. This is not the case. The U.S. remains a party to the U.N. Refugee Convention. We believe that the agreement remains a comprehensive vehicle for the fair, compassionate, and orderly handling of asylum claims in our two countries, end quote. After speaking with Dr. Arbel, it seems like Ruba and her family were one of the lucky ones, brought in through the private sponsorship program. And while she considers herself very fortunate, in 2016, she had to adapt to life in Canada, and it wasn't an easy process. Every step were difficult. The most difficult one is to find a job, which everyone has the same difficulties. Um, Understanding the system wasn't that difficult because there are a lot of information online. There were a lot of uh, organizations helping newcomers and refugees. You just need to do your homework and try to find it. But finding a job and starting from zero uh, was difficult. That's the, ch- the most challenging for me, I believe. This was Ruba's experience. But a question still lingered for me. What about the rest of the Kurdi family? It was a photo of Alan that experts say ignited the fire in officials to bring Syrian refugees to Canada. You might remember from our last episode that Alan Kurdi's aunt, Tima, had another brother, Mohammed, whose application to come to Canada had been denied. I asked Tima about this. During that time, when the election stuff, after um, I had a phone call from um, the Immigration of Canada. And um, that time, it's the, um, our uh, immigration officer was uh, John McCallum, I think. I, um, the office uh, phoned me to arrange a phone call with him. So um, the phone call, of course, you know, our condolences and, you know, this is something it shouldn't happen. And please, when Abdullah is ready to come to Canada, you know, contact my office. And um, the same office where I was uh, trying with the paperwork with Muhammad back and forth, at the end, always missing this paper, missing that paper, they contact me to resubmit the application and your family is going to come. Again, it's, it's kind of, it's bittersweet, kind of, you know, thank God, yes, I'll give them this one, you know, safe. It was a good news. On December 28th, 2015, Mohammed Kurdi and his wife and their five children landed in Canada. Thank you, Canada. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I am uh, happy. I am very happy. Alan's father... Abdullah chose to stay behind. You know, as a father, trying, you were doing all this to flee to different country, either Canada or Europe, your hope, you are going to give it to your own family, to the kids, not to yourself. Parents put themselves 
they do everything to protect their own children. So after they're gone, he said to me, you know, I was going for them, not for my own. I don't want it. I don't want anything. In 2015, Canada brought in thousands of refugees, but I was curious about what happened in other countries around the world. The Pew Research Center, a U.S. think tank, took a deep dive into this in 2016. They found that in 2015, 1.3 million migrants applied for asylum in countries within the European Union. About half of those refugees were coming from three countries. Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Most came from Syria, 378,000 in 2015, which is almost 30% of all of Europe's asylum seekers. That year, the country with the most asylum seekers was Germany, with over 440,000 asylum applications in that year alone. But Pew Research Center also looked at how people felt about the EU's response to the increase in refugees. They surveyed over 10,000 people across 10 EU member states and found the majority of those who responded to the survey said they disapproved of the handling of the issue. They also found countries with a high number of asylum seekers had the highest disapproval. As the Syrian refugee crisis ruled the headlines, I remembered the Refugees Are Welcome Here campaigns. It seemed that they were mostly welcomed in Canada, but there were some who were concerned about the potential negative economic impacts this would have. Was there any truth to the fear that unemployment rates could go up? I reached out to Mustafa Alio to help me understand this concern. He started Jumpstart Refugee. We serve no one but refugees and we do nothing but economic empowerment. We try to place refugees with um, a meaningful jobs. Mustafa is originally from Syria. He was studying here in Canada and when things became dangerous, he realized he would not be able to return home. But even then, he had difficulty accepting the idea of becoming a refugee. I am the same person. Nothing changed um, in a way. The only thing changed is that legal status. It's just status on the paper, but then a whole perception of people, that's it. And I always say, to be honest, I, I was, I think at one point I was stupid to fall into the trap and hide the fact that I'm a refugee because of the perception of people. He believes there's often a stigma that surrounds refugees. He says he's heard people tell him many times they believe refugees become a burden on a country's economy. But Mustafa says in his work, he found the opposite is true. He says that for refugees, coming to Canada, finding work was one of the biggest priorities. Job was, or employment, is the only tool psychologically and and, and and physically or actually in real life, it's the only tool for refugees that allow them to give back, give them a little bit of dignity. It's the only tool that saying, you know, I'm not going to help you. I'm just going to give you a tool that you can go on and then you can support others. I always tell everyone, I'm someone who's very open-minded. If you convince me that refugees are economic burden based on facts and and you know, like a real life incidence, uh, overall or research, I'm going to be the first to be with you. And then, you know, literally kind of yell and maybe I will go and then work with you and just kind of to put the case that refugees are economic burden. I think what I believe today is that those who would say that refugees are economic burdens are one of two. They're either someone who is just xenophobic and, and racist and just because they cannot say it, they just say that economic burden is kind of the easy route to it. So, oh, you know, like, you know, we would love to have them, but they're economic burden. And there are those who truly believe that they are economic burden. And, and I think I would invite them and I would love to have a conversation with any of those every time. There was a study that actually done in Vancouver City that 2,500 Syrian refugees and early on, that they would add $563 million to the economy 20 years. This is in profit. That's a nut profit. In 2019, the UNHCR, the UN Agency for Refugees, released some statistics. 
They found that after 20 years in Canada, refugees contribute more to Canada in income taxes, not counting all of the other taxes they pay, than they receive in public benefits and services. They also found that over 14% of refugees are self-employed or business owners. And if we look at unemployment, According to the statistics from the UNHCR, refugees have an unemployment rate of 9%, close to that of Canadian citizens by birth, which is at 6%. But there's one point that Mustafa brought up to me that really stuck with me, and it was around the perception of refugees. Refugees today mostly perceived either as um, a threat or an economic burdens or as heroes. Mainly you see a lot of media or even people just talking about, or even people in general, not only media, but talking about refugees from two perspectives. So either someone who's overachieved, then everyone start talking about. So we always kind of, you know, we have as if that we have to overachieve for us to be notarized, like everyone talk about. But then, and then if not, or the other is like economic burden, I think the vast majority of refugees, those who are, literally in the middle, like the one that you met today, Ruba. Um, those who are hardworking people uh, trying to live a safe life and, you know, falling in love with the country that gave them safety more than ever. But those are, unfortunately, are the many that not many people talk about. And I think if we ever to change this narrative and drown refugees, um, we need to start focusing on those people. <laughs> In 2015, we learned that the federal government had promised to bring 25,000 Syrian refugees to Canada, and they would eventually reach that number. But one question I had, and maybe you're thinking it too, how many refugees have come to Canada in recent years? I reached out to Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, and they said in 2019, 30,000 refugees resettled in Canada. 19,000 were privately sponsored refugees. These are people like Ruba. 10,000 were government-assisted refugees. And another 1,000 were part of the blended sponsorship program. In 2020, that number dropped significantly. In total, from January 2020 to November, there were just over 8,000 admissions of resettled refugees as permanent residents. A spokesperson from Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada said migration has been upended by the pandemic, and the entire resettlement ecosystem is operating at a reduced capacity. A statement reads, and I quote, On March 18, 2020, the Government of Canada implemented a number of temporary measures, including travel restrictions to protect the health and safety of Canadians and to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Altogether, these many constraints have resulted in Canada welcoming fewer refugees in 2020 than previous years. There is one question I still couldn't stop thinking about, and I've heard arguments about this as well. Can Canada sustain an influx of refugees? I mean, could this even happen? For this question, I once again turn to Dr. Arbel. It's a, it's a common argument and it's an argument that we hear around the world. Um, and, and I understand where the argument comes from, but it's important to recognize that in Canada, we will never face a flood of refugees. Canada is so geographically far removed from the world's uh, biggest conflict regions that it is just exceedingly difficult to get here. We are surrounded by three oceans and a land border with the United States. Um, and the, the numbers of, of refugee claimants that we receive here is truly minuscule when compared with the levels of global displacement that we see around the world. It's alarming to, to hear this kind of discourse that, you know, our, our borders will be flooded and, uh, you know, we can't accept all of the world's refugees But when we actually look at the numbers because it, it, the numbers of people who, who, who might want to come here if the borders were opened a little bit more would be entirely manageable. I think it's also really important to remember that we 
have signed on to the Refugee Convention uh, willingly, and that this is an international document that, that imposes clear legal obligations on us. We are obligated to extend a measure of fairness and rights protections to refugees. This is not something that we can opt out of um, just because of, uh, you know, a particular government's objectives or in accordance with, with kind of the will of the populace. This is a, this is a pre-commitment that we have signed on to and that, that recognizes a certain interconnectedness uh, around the world and a certain obligation that persecuted people should at the very least have a way to survive. And if we are able to assist in that in just in just a tiny way uh, to alleviate a little bit of suffering, to alleviate, assist in preventing human rights violations from happening, then it's not just a moral obligation, it's a legal one. Dr. Arbel said by opening our borders, there would be more transparency on who is coming in. Prior to the implementation of the Safe Third Country Agreement, um, most refugees entered through ports of entry. They were accounted for. Uh, the Canadian government knew who was entering, when and where they were going. Um, the advocacy community was able to assist and provide these individuals with, with um, the legal assistance and community assistance that they required um, in order to effectively process their claims. The border was, on the whole, well-regulated and more safe um, than it is now. What happens with measures like the Safe Third Country Agreement is that the um, the safe modes of entry, the lawful modes of entry, become harder and harder and harder to access. Um, when you're facing a, a, a threat to your life or the life of your loved ones, you can't stay where you are. You will go. You will go to try to save your life and the life of your children and, and, and the, the people you love. Um, and so if Canada uh, closes ports of entry, all that does is push people to uncertain and precarious modes of entry. And we've seen that happen since the Safe Third Country Agreement came into effect and with increasing numbers in recent years. Um, people don't stop crossing, they just stop crossing at the port of entry. Instead, they'll cross in between ports of entry um, and oftentimes you know, risk their lives doing so. We've seen deaths at the border. We've seen um, extraordinary losses at the border. And we've seen people go through, um, tr you know, tr truly precarious journeys just in order to set foot on Canadian soil. Um, we've seen a marked rise in irregular border entries. Um, and all that does is it makes the border more dangerous and more disorderly in between ports of entry. And Dr. Arbel said even if they enter the country as an asylum seeker, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll be granted refugee protection. What happens when an individual sets foot on Canadian soil, all they're eligible for is to make a refugee claim. And that's a lengthy and rigorous and onerous process. We set the terms as to who we deem um, uh, is eligible to be a refugee. This is our own laws, our own interpretations. Uh, refugee claimants have to undergo um, a process. They have to fill out extensive paperwork. They have to go through screenings. They have to appear before the Immigration and Refugee Board, make their claim, and demonstrate that they satisfy the parameters of the refugee definition as it is interpreted in Canadian law. Canada always retains the ability to, to decide uh, whether or not an individual can stay. By opening our borders, we are not granting asylum. We are just granting the right to seek asylum. And that's a fundamentally important distinction. Ruba has lived in Canada now for four years. It took time, but she and her husband both found jobs here. My husband find a job after, I think, five weeks. He could manage to work with Sears. And then it took me around more than a year to find a job. But in this year, I was volunteering. I worked, um, I volunteered in, in, in many things here in Canada because I, I love working with communities. And I just also want to understand more about the community here. And I felt that... Uh, 
I need to do something. They helped me a lot as a community here in Canada. I want to also pay back. I want to pay it forward, as one of my sponsors told me, because he was so helpful. And I, I, I remember I told him, how can I thank you? And he said, uh, pay it forward. And I said, what does it mean, pay it forward? So he explained it to me. It was a new concept for me. So, uh, so I volunteered. I worked in a board for new settlements, uh, for settlement agencies as well. I start also cooking for homeless. Uh, I, I start helping newcomers as well, like me, new refugees that they don't know what to do, guide them that you have this service, you have to do this. This is how to do your paper. So I start also me and my husband stepping and helping people. Um, and after one year, I managed to work in a property management company as administrator, HR administrator. And from there, I start building my career. So... Ruba was also able to sponsor her son in July 2018, four years after seeing him board a plane to Germany in Lebanon. They were finally reunited. Her eldest son is working and her younger son is in school. And recently, Ruba and her husband bought their first home together. And while she never thought life would bring her here to Canada, she says she's grateful I'm, I'm so much happy. I, I never been experienced such feeling in all my life. Uh, I felt myself, I'm human. I'm back to be normal. I have my rights. They were showing me my rights. And uh, this for me, it's, it's really important. I'm, I'm just see, experiencing everything new here in Canada and I'm enjoying it. And I'm contributing, uh, me and my family, we keep contributing as much as we can to this community. So uh, we're doing fine here and we're just spending our time, free time, helping people to integrate and find jobs and understand the system here. The Syrian refugee crisis was at the forefront in 2015. But what has happened since then? Did the crisis just go away? It's a question that I brought to Rima Jamos, who works for the UNHCR. Absolutely not. Um, Ten years now into the conflict in Syria, we see that civilians continue to be the ones who who bear the brunt of that violence and insecurity. Uh, The situation now, in, in some respects, is even worse than what it was in 2015. You now have over 11 million Syrians who are in need of humanitarian assistance just to meet their basic needs. So they cannot survive without humanitarian assistance. 11 million people, that's not a small, small number. Uh, We know that over half the population has been forced from their homes. And in some instances, they've been victims of multiple displacement and had to flee several times because of ongoing violence or um, other other drivers uh, where they happen to be. We know that the country is full of destroyed civilian infrastructure, homes and schools and hospitals, all, all of which have yet to be rebuilt. And we know that, that, that sadly, uh, children and youth actually comprise half of those who are displaced and half of those who need humanitarian assistance. So children and youth who do not otherwise but for humanitarian assistance don't have the essentials they need to live. And she told me the COVID-19 pandemic has made things even more challenging. So what we have now in Syria, like elsewhere in the world, serious economic downturn. Some of that is obviously pre-COVID, but COVID has only enhanced uh, those vulnerabilities. People who were able to, to somehow make ends meet or rely on work in the informal economy have seen those jobs vanish. We have seen skyrocketing prices um, for basic items in Syria. The lack of access to essential services, shortages across the country of many basic goods. And in fact, what we're seeing now is that under the current conditions, socioeconomic conditions in Syria, those represent some of the most challenging humanitarian conditions experienced by Syrians uh, in the last 10 years. So when you're looking at a situation of continued conflict and insecurity and um, 80% of the population living below the poverty line, it's very difficult to say that Syria and the Syrian refugee crisis uh, have, have gone away. Okay, so it hasn't gone away. 
But hearing this, I just felt this sense of helplessness. I asked Rima, what could people be doing to help make things better? We know that Canada and Canadians in particular have been extremely generous um, and welcoming of Syrian refugees. And we know that communities have have opened their homes, their doors, and tried to support um, the resettlement of refugees across the country in a way that is truly a life-saving solution for families who would otherwise have absolutely nowhere else to turn. But there's a lot that needs to be done to address the needs that remain. And, and that includes doing things like supporting the ongoing humanitarian response. Like I said, 11 million people living within Syria still need um, support in order to live, basic humanitarian uh, assistance. So people and countries can be supporting the humanitarian actors that are delivering those life-saving uh, responses in Syria. and. We can also really rally uh, the international community to do more in terms of advancing the political agenda on Syria and trying to carve out durable, lasting political solutions to the problem there. Because so long as those root causes remain unaddressed and unresolved, you will continue to see humanitarian needs generated. And humanitarian uh, assistance will never, ever be an effective substitute for political action. Ferry de Kirchhoff, who works as an advisor to the president of the University of Ottawa for Security, Women and Peace, told me to this day, there is still great instability in the region. Well, it's still happening in a sense that Bashar al-Assad is trying to reconquer his country, particularly that Turkey has occupied a band of uh, along its border of about 20 kilometers, 20 miles, depending on how you compute it. And, and, uh, and Turkey doesn't want to let go. But I want to come back also to the point about the refugees, because it's a, it's a huge problem. And, and the, the, the difficulty for Syrians who think that maybe the situation is abating, getting a bit quieter, uh, they're are invited by, by their president to come back, or if they don't come back, their properties will be taken and distributed to some of the friends of Bashar al-Assad. So there's this horrible pressure on Syrian who know perfectly well that when they come back, they'll be subjected to some, you know, serious, serious, serious issues because they've betrayed their country, their left. So the situation today is just as unstable. The only difference is that Daesh now is more or less out. I wanted to get back to Alan Kurdi's story. In 2016, a Turkish court sentenced two Syrian smugglers to four years and two months each over the deaths of five people, which included two-year-old Alan Kurdi, his brother Galib, and his mother, Rehana. I also checked in on Tima Kurdi to find out how Alan's father, Abdullah, was doing after his child's death galvanized us into action. She says Abdullah is living in Kurdistan now. He's remarried and has welcomed a new child. She told me her other brother, Mohammed, has settled well in Canada. But recently, she's been working to get her sister Shireen and her family to Canada. Shireen had been traveling back and forth between Syria and Turkey. Her hope was always to return to her home country. But Tima said the situation became so dire in Syria, Shireen made the decision to stay in Turkey. Tima says because Shireen has been traveling back and forth between the two countries, she's been unable to get a crucial piece of documentation to start the refugee process, the Kimlik, a Turkish identity card. So what has changed really from 2014 or 2015 until now? Nothing. So why do I have to repeat the same thing same struggle just because I want to have my family with me. Is that fair? Tima says she won't give up. But she also told me she knows the story of the Kurdi family is not necessarily a unique one. There are thousands of Syrians looking to find safety in a new country. Many who have made the dangerous journey to do so, but died trying to get there. And beyond that, there are refugees from other countries other than Syria who face dangerous living conditions and violations to basic human rights 
each and every day. We are people around the world. They know, they watch the news, they hear people struggle, but they just turn their back and walk away and live their life. Because this is not their reality, not their problem and not their family. After talking to Tima and all of the experts as part of this story, it really hit me. The need is not over. While it might not be in the headlines, there are people still to this day making dangerous journeys like Alan Curdy and his family did over five years ago. And the truth is that many won't ever make it or find safety at the end of their perilous journey. Thank you for joining me this week. A special thanks goes to Tima Curdy for sharing her family's story. Whatever Happened To is written and produced by me, Erica Bella, with producer Dila Velasquez. Our audio producer is Rob Johnson. And a special thanks goes to Beatrice Politi. Let us know what you thought of this episode and please share it with a friend. It'll help us to grow the show and bring you more incredible stories. You can also help us out by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also reach out to me personally. We are always looking for stories. So if there's a new story you want us to revisit, you can reach me on Twitter at Erica Vella or email me at erica.vella at globalnews.ca. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. 